I need one volunteer here in Weaverville to come up on the platform with me really quick. It honestly doesn't matter who it is. I need one brave volunteer to jump up here. And am I going to have to call somebody? There are no brave. All right, come on up. Now, Paul, I appreciate your bravery that you demonstrated as your wife pushed you out of your seat. I said, I saw that. Now, I want you to, I want you to uh, take something. I've got, a, I've got a gift for you. It's not actually not a gift, but I want you to hold on to it for me. I brought a $100 bill to the platform. Okay. I'm going to give this to you. Now, I want you to make me a promise. Okay. And the promise is that you're going to give this back to me when our service is over. So I want you to promise out loud. I want you to say, I will give this back to you. I will give this $100 back to you, Pastor. You promise. I promise. Come find me. I will be at the fireplace. Okay. Come find me and give that back. I will. Will you? Yes, sir. Okay, I you promise. can have a seat. Thank you. Will you all tell, tell uh, Paul you appreciate him? So, so he just made me a promise, a $100 promise. Now the question is, can I count on him? Do you think... That the $100 that was in my pocket and now is in his, do you think that's coming back to me after service? You feel pretty good about that? Well, here's the, here's the question for the day. When is a promise like that, when is a promise as good as a possession? Think about it. When is a promise as good as a possession? We're going to talk about that for a little bit today. So welcome to week number eight of our study through the life and the family and the faith of Abraham. Those of you who have been faithfully uh, attending over these last two months will remember that we have spent all of our time on Sunday mornings over these last seven weeks leading up to today focusing intently on the faith of Abraham. We've seen it in its strength. We've watched it as it's faltered a time or two as well. And we have learned that Abraham was called by God the father of faith or the father of all believers. Because of his faith, God has said that for all of us who have faith in him, Abraham is in fact our spiritual father. We learned some really great news about Abraham where the Bible said that Abraham believed God He had faith in God and his word, and that faith was counted for righteousness. And we discovered that none of us possess righteousness on our own, but God counts our faith as righteousness. That's an important thing to know. We talked about the fact that faith, true faith, is not um, something that's built upon fantasy, It's not something that we come up with on our own and say, this is what I believe because I believe it and this is my faith. No, faith, true faith, is based on the firm foundation of the word of God. It's it's rooted in the scriptures. And in fact, that really is what it means to have faith. It is to believe uh, that God is and to believe that God will keep his word. And today in our text in Genesis chapter number 21, we are going to see the reward of Abraham's faith as he does in fact see God keep his promise to him. Genesis 21, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1, just seven verses, or really six verses today. You follow along as I read. Verse 1 says, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him whom Sarah bare to him. Abraham called his name Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac being eight days old as God had commanded him. And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh so that all that hear this news will laugh with me. Now, if, if Abraham was 100 years old, as verse number 5 tells us, then we know that Sarah was 90 years old at the time of the conception and the birth of Isaac. 
And so it really is, by all measures, a miraculous conception and birth of this promised son, Isaac. And what we see, if we learn anything at all, when we finally arrive in chapter 21, and you'll agree it's taken us eight weeks now to get to the birth of Isaac, but what you learn when you finally get here is this, and I want you to jot it down, it is that God always keeps his promises. If you don't forget anything, or if you forget everything else I say today, and you don't remember anything but this, remember this, God always keeps his promises. Three times in two verses in chapter number 21, you hear this declaration, as he said. Look at it in verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he said he would. Verse number 1. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken he would. Verse 2, for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken. Three times in two verses, the Bible says that in the birth of Isaac, God did what he said he would do, and he did it when he said he would do it. God kept his word. In fact, if you turn back one page to chapter number 17, you'll see the specific promise, the specific time when God said that Sarah would have a son. Look at chapter 17 and verse 15. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, do not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Verse 16, and I will bless her and give you a son of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be the mother of nations. Literally, a nation of people shall come from her. That's the promise of God. Sarah will have so many descendants that a nation will be born. Chapter 18 and verse 10 makes the same promise. Look at it. And he said, God speaking, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. These are the specific promises where God said to Abraham, Sarah's going to have a baby. If you remember, uh, as we've been working through this passage, you will know why God is being so emphatic in chapter number 17 that Sarah's going to have the baby. Do you remember why? Because they had conceived a plan whereby Abraham would have a son through Ishmael, or through Hagar, who would be called Ishmael. And God says, no, no, it's not going to be another woman that's going to have your son. It is going to be uh, Sarah who is going to have your son. Specifically, God promised that she would have the baby. Now, we also know that God had made the promise to Abraham that he would have this son many, many years before chapter 17. In fact, All the way back in chapter number 12, God had promised to Abraham a son, that he would father a child and that the covenant that God was entering into with him would be wrapped up in the promise of this child. Do you remember from Genesis 12, the Abrahamic covenant, way back in the beginning of the series, we we talked about the Abrahamic covenant. And in Genesis chapter 12, God made three promises to Abraham. Number one, you're going to have descendants. You're going to have a son and then many descendants from there. Second promise, I'm going to give you a land. And in that land, your people will live and your people living in that land will then be a blessing to the whole earth. Those are the three promises that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter number 12. However, When you come to Genesis chapter 23, turn there if you will, in Genesis chapter number 23, 50 years have passed since the time that God made the promise to Abraham. In Genesis 23, Sarah, his wife, has died. And Abraham needs to bury his deceased wife. And yet... He does not possess even enough land to bury his wife. 
50 years have passed and he still doesn't possess that land. In fact, look at chapter number 23, beginning in verse 14. You'll see this negotiation where Abraham is going to buy a little piece of land so that he can bury his wife. Genesis 23, verse 14 says, And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. But what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed out to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver. Verse 17, in the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was the field which was before Mamre, the field, the cave that was in the field, all the trees that were in the field, under the borders of the field, All of this land was made sure unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of the city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave in the field of Machpelah. Now remember, Genesis 12, God said, I'm going to give you a son. In fact, that son will only be the beginning of so many descendants that your sons and daughters, your children will be counted like the stars of the heaven. That's how many you're going to have. Secondly, I'm going to give you a land. And that is going to be the entirety of the land of Canaan. And thirdly, I'm going to bless the whole world through your faith and obedience. And you come to chapter number 23, and Abraham is 137 years old. And so far, he has one promised son. And that boy's not even married yet, let alone producing generations. He owns one little piece of the promised land, enough to bury his bride, and he had to pay for that. God didn't give that to him. And number three, there's no sign of any global blessing coming at all because of his faith and obedience. Those are the facts. And so the question is, do those facts, 50 years after the promise, do those facts weigh as evidence against my statement a moment ago that God always keeps his promises? The answer to that question is no. In fact, a thousand times no. Here's what I want you to know. Write it down somewhere in your notes. That with God, a promise is as sure as a possession. If you believe it, shout amen. In fact, I want you to say it out loud with me, both campuses. A promise is as sure as a possession. It's just that sometimes... We have to wait in the promise for a while before we receive the possession. It really is true. Someone has said that in the Bible, there are over 7,000 promises that God makes to mankind. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm sure there are a lot, but somebody counted and found more than 7,000. But I want to share with you this morning four, only four promises that God has surely made to every one of us who know Jesus. Let's write them down. The first one, we'll go through them quickly. The first one is this. God has promised that he will always provide us with everything that we need. Listen carefully. This is a sure promise from God. He will always... Provide his sons and daughters with everything that we need. If I do not possess something at the moment, then God has determined that I don't need it at the moment. Now, I might need it tomorrow. I might need it in 30 minutes. I might need it next year. But when I need it, God has promised that he will supply it. He always meets Our needs. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19 says this. It says that my God shall supply 
all your need. Now, pop quiz, how much of your need does Philippians 4.19 say that God will supply? God shall supply, say it, all your need. Not some, not most, not parts. God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told us that we matter more to him than the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, and yet God provides to the birds of the air and the flowers of the field all that they need and that he will provide those things to us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, Paul writes, and God is able. If you're glad God is able, shout amen. amen. I'm so glad he's able. I'm so unable so many times, but God is able. Able to what? God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound unto every good work. Here's the promise God has made to you. He will always supply you with what you need. Here's the second promise I want to share with you. It is that he uses all things to accomplish his purpose in our lives. Everything. Let me say it plainly. Hear me. Nothing is wasted. God uses all things to accomplish his purpose in our lives. Romans 8, 28, one of the most quoted verses in scripture, known by almost every believer, goes like this. And we no. Does it say we think so? No, it doesn't say that we hope this is true. It says, and we know that all things, pop quiz, how many things? Shout it, all things. And we know that all things. That means the good things, but it also means the things that aren't good. It means the pleasant circumstances when things are going right, but it also means the negative circumstances when things are going wrong. It means the joyful moments in our lives, but it also means the painful moments in our lives. God uses how many things? Shout it, all things. To do what? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And in fact, if you go read verse number 29 of Romans 8, as well, it says that the purpose of God is to shape the likeness of Jesus in us. And so God is using everything in our lives to accomplish his purpose. And his purpose is to make us more like Jesus. He uses everything for it. He will always provide us with everything that we need. He will use all things to accomplish his purpose in our lives. Third promise he's made is this. He will turn our suffering into triumph. Now, God didn't promise you that you wouldn't suffer in this life. In fact, Jesus promised the opposite, didn't he? Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. Things are going to go wrong. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You haven't been promised a suffering-free life. Here's what you have been promised, that God will always turn your suffering into triumph. Revelation tells us that one day he will make all things right, and what's wrong today will be made right. What's upside down today will be made right side up. He will make all things new. Romans 8, 18 says this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. God has promised you that he will turn your sufferings into triumph. Fourthly and finally, he has promised that he will come back to get us. He's promised us this. In John chapter number 14 in verse three, Jesus said, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you. I will welcome you into my presence so that you may be where I am. In the same way that God had made promises to Abraham, and Abraham had to wait for those promises, God has made promises to us. And like Abraham, we sometimes have to wait to receive the promise. Now, begs the question, doesn't it? Why do you have to wait? 
But can I just admit, I'm not a fan of waiting, are you? I don't like to wait at restaurants. I don't like to wait in traffic. I don't like to wait on my <laughs> children. In my estimation, microwaves are too slow. I don't like to wait. And yet God says, Jim, I'm going to do a work in you while you wait. Have you considered this? In in the promises that God made to Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, I'm going to give you a son and many descendants. I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to bless the whole world through you. Have you considered the amount of time that it took for God to keep those promises? Let's consider the first promise. I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you descendants. He made that promise in Genesis chapter number 12. We just read of its possession when Abraham actually possessed that promise in chapter number 21 when Isaac was born. Do you know how many years there are between Genesis 12 and Genesis 21? There's at least 25 years. There's, in truth, probably more like 35 years. So God made a promise, and then all through his journeys, all through his, his uh, sojourning in the land of Canaan, he had to wait and wait and wait until at least two, two and a half, maybe three, three and a half decades passed before God gave him that promise, before he fulfilled that promise. Now, why do you think? I believe that they made him wait because all along the way, God was shaping Abraham into the man he wanted him to be to fulfill the promise. Listen to me carefully. If you're listening to both campuses, shout amen. Listen, God doesn't just want to fulfill his promise to you. He wants to fulfill his promise to the man or the woman that he wants you to be. And the waiting is a process whereby he is shaping and refining you and strengthening your faith and trust in him to make you what he wants you to be to fulfill the promise. The second part of the promise that he made in Genesis 12 was that he said, I'm going to give you a land. And he defined it, the land of Canaan. He gave the borders of it. He said, I'm going to give you this land. And do you know when they actually, when Abraham's descendants actually began to possess that land? Joshua chapter number three. Do you know how much time elapses from Genesis 12 to Joshua three? You ready? 500 years. Why did it take 500 years for God to keep that part of the promise. Why did they have to wait so long? Turn back to Genesis 15. Let me show you the answer. Look at Genesis 15 beginning in verse number 13. God explains to Abraham. He said unto Abraham, Know of a surety, know for certain, that your descendants shall be a stranger in a land That is not theirs. And they shall serve those people. And those people will afflict them for 400 years. What was the land where the children of Abraham uh, were afflicted for 400 years? Egypt, right? It's the land of Egypt. So he says they're going to go into the land of Egypt. They're going to be held there as, as slaves for 400 years. Also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. And after I judge that nation with 10 plagues, then they shall Come forth, your children shall come forth out of there with great substance. The Exodus tells us this happened. Verse 15, you shall go to your fathers in peace. That is, you're going to die. You shall be buried in a good old age. Verse 16, but in the fourth generation, four generations out, we're going to go 500, 400 plus at least years forward. They, your descendants, shall come here to this land of Canaan again. Watch this reasoning. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Like everybody should go, like mind-blowing. Because here's what God is saying. Abraham, I'm going to bring your descendants into this land. But the Amorites who live in the land now, they're going to be judged by your people, your descendants coming into this land. But their iniquity, the time of their judgment hasn't come. And it won't come for 400 years. And so you're going to, they're going to come back and their coming into the land is going to drive out those inhabitants of the land, the Amorites. Because at that time, it will be time for me to judge them. But do you know what that 400 years is before that judgment falls? You know what it is for the Amorites? It's a space of grace. God's given them time to turn and repent, and yet they don't. They ultimately get judged. 
But God held the Israelites out of Canaan for all those years until it was time for judgment to fall on the Amorites. Third part of the promise from Genesis 12, God said, I'm going to bless the whole earth through you. And we know from Paul's writings that the blessing of the whole earth that he promised was in fact the the life and death, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the, the salvation that Jesus would bring, promised in Genesis 12. Do you know when Jesus arrived? Luke chapter 2. And do you know how much time elapsed from Genesis 12 to Luke 2? 2,000 years. And you say, why would God wait 2,000 years to keep that part of the promise? Well, Galatians 4.4 4 tells us that God waited until it was just the right time. And then he sent forth his son. 25, 35 years till the baby was born. 500 years before they got the land. 2,000 years before the blessing on the whole earth came. And all the while God was working in Abraham. Working in the land and working in the world. Listen to me carefully. When you're waiting in the promise For the possession, know this, that in the waiting, God hasn't forgotten you. God is not ignoring where you are. God's not indifferent to your circumstance. God is working in you and all around you to do his perfect will. And when it's time, you will receive the promise. Because God always keeps his promises. And if you know that, if you're confident of that, if you have that certainty then you can have joy in the waiting. Write it down this way, that what Abraham and Sarah's experience teaches us is that there is joy in the promise as there is in the possession. We know there's joy when God keeps his promise, but what Abraham teaches us is that there's joy in the waiting for the promise as well. Look at verse number three. I'm back in chapter 21 and verse number three where it tells us plainly, that Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him. Abraham named him Isaac. He named him Isaac because God told him to name him Isaac, chapter 17. But God told him to name the baby Isaac because the name Isaac means laughter. It means to laugh out loud. It means to have fullness of joy. In chapter number 17, in verse 17, when God said to Abraham, You're going to have this child through Sarah. Chapter 17 says that Abraham laughed out loud. And it wasn't the mocking laugh of Sarah that occurred later. This was the laughter of faith. It was the laughter of Abraham going, can it really be? Is God really going to do this thing for me? She's really going to have a baby. Wow, Lord, thank you. And in the waiting, he was full of joy. But Sarah had joy in the possession. Look at chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. Verse number 5 said that Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. That made Sarah 90 years old. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. Well, amen. This 90-year-old lady had a baby and she's laughing. She's thrilled. She's finally holding the baby that God had so long promised that she would hold. And she says, God has made me to laugh so that all who hear this news will laugh with me. In chapter 17, it tells us that God changed Sarah's name from Sarai to Sarah because she was going to have this baby and many descendants. And the name Sarah means the prevailing one. And while she couldn't conceive all of her life, and in those years when people around her were conceiving and Hagar was conceiving and she couldn't conceive and produce this baby that God had promised. She didn't seem like she was prevailing. She seemed like she was losing. But God said, I'm going to call you Sarah because ultimately you are going to prevail. I'm going to keep my word to you. Listen to me carefully. We as believers can face the reality of death with joy. Now, none of us want to die. I'm not looking forward to death. But here's what I know. 
that when the time comes, be it suddenly or, or in a slow fade into the grave, whatever happens, as we approach death as believers, we can approach it with a smile on our face because we have been promised eternal life and we can have as much joy in the passing as we will have when we have passed into eternity. This is the reason you see people who don't know Christ trembling at the thought of death and people who do know Christ saying, oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? Because in the promise, there's joy. It means we can face the grave of a loved one. We can bury somebody we love with joy. doesn't mean we're happy about it. doesn't mean we don't grieve over it. doesn't mean we don't have deep heaves of gut-wrenching sorrow, but somewhere for the believer in the midst of all of that grieving, there is a deep, settled joy. Because if my loved one knew Jesus, I know my loved one wouldn't come back for a thousand lifetimes. And they would stay there and one day I will be reunited with them. We can face suffering We can deal with suffering. We can walk through the deepest valleys of life. Sure, it's hard, and yes, it's difficult, and yes, there's pain and disappointment, but in that deep valley, there's joy because I know this. God is not indifferent to my suffering. He will not not, uh, waste my suffering, and he will turn it for glory eventually. We can wait for Christ to come with joy. When the world is fallen apart and, and it seems as if the world's lost its mind and we seem like we're becoming more and more alienated from family and friends and culture as we believe the Bible and we seem we're, we're made to appear crazier and crazier in this culture. We can just smile in their perceived craziness of us all the way until Jesus comes because one day we know he's coming. So there's joy in the promise and there's joy in the possession. If I know these things, I can have joy even as I wait. Thirdly and finally in this passage, you see Abraham's joyful response of obedience. I mean, if you, if you know these things and God has proven himself to you through the waiting and in the possession now, then what could you do but obey? Chapter 21 and verse number 4 says that Abraham circumcised his son Isaac being eight days old as God had commanded him. Chapter 17, verse 10, God said, this is the mark. This is to be the mark upon every baby boy that is born to you. I want you to mark him for this covenant. And Abraham obeyed, joyfully, willingly obeyed, because that was the mark of the covenant. And in the same way, when we know these things to be true, that there is joy in the waiting as well as in the possession. There's joy in the promise as well as the time when God fulfills the promise then we will obey him. And that obedience, even in the waiting, listen to me, that obedience, even in the waiting, is the mark of the covenant. It is evidence of the fact that I am in covenant with God because my heart is to obey him. I don't always do it, but our heart and our desire is to obey him. It's what these 13 folks are going to do in our next service as they come and line up and get one by one into the baptistry and are immersed and identified with Christ in baptism. They are joyfully obeying what Christ has commanded them to do. Believe and be baptized. And so they are showing a mark of their covenant relationship with God. I asked you at the beginning, when is a promise as good as a possession? And it is any time God makes a promise. He's good for us.